Okay, as we finish out this evening, we're going to enter the Twilight Zone um, and talk about something that will blow your mind. So let's welcome up Mandy Wamaki, chat with us about <laughs>
So this is how we move to the idea of quantum computing, which is basically using particles, ions, electrons, even just light, photons, to carry this information and to carry all these processes that I've explained thus far, and to compute using it. So welcome to the realm of quantum. So bits are replaced by qubits. That's just changing the name. So you take a specific particle, say a nine, and you look at um, you look at the property of it. <coughs> now the most popular one that is used these days is spin. And the simplest way to explain it is really just the direction that the particle spins. Okay, is it spinning up or down? So let's link upward spin to a one down or spin to a zero that replaces our curvature. Now, a thousand of these particles, that's literally a thousand atoms, that's almost nothing. They can hold any number between zero and zero, which is quite a lot. This is in the order of 3,000 gigabytes of numbers. That's more than the assumed number of particles in the universe right now. So if we can just put a thousand small atoms together in a computer, we will be reaching a storage capacity that was never mentioned. So the way, the way this can work is based on two attributes of quantum mechanics, two attributes of quantum physics. The first one is superposition. What this says is that in the quantum theory in general, taking a measurement is an active part of the interaction you can be having with a particle. Like in general physics, once you look at something and can read a value, you kind of assume that before it still had a value. In quantum physics, it's not exactly the case. So basically, when a particle is unknown and a particle is unobserved, you assume that it's holding all possible values it can ever have. So a quantum bit can either be a zero, can either be a one, or both. Yes, I know it's a bit weird, but that, this has actually been proven. Um, <coughs> once you measure it, then that stage will collapse into like that superposition stage will collapse into either zero or one and it will remain stuck in that value. Now, um, yeah, one thing I mentioned is that it's kind of random. You can never tell for sure if it's going to be a zero or if it's going to be a one. Yet, when it comes to spin, you can actually change the spin. A specific particle is, like, the direction of the spin of a specific particle is visual. Now, the phenomenon that is both on the superposition and that is quite a lot more complicated is called entangle. You all know this guy, right? <laughs> Who thinks this guy is actually smart? Come on. So the way this guy defined entanglement is... <laughs> so, yeah, he wasn't very helpful, so I <laughs> looked at someone else. Um, Einstein wasn't a big fan of the quantum theory. This guy, on the other hand, really liked it. His name is Erwin Schrodinger. And the way he defined the technology is quite a set of, from Einstein's definition. And he said that the best possible knowledge of the whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of all these parts. Even though they may be entirely separate, and therefore virtually capable of being best possibly known. Now, in English, <laughs> that you can know an information for sure about a system as a whole without knowing the specific information about all its constituents. Now, one property will be enchanted, one property will hold true. Say, the distance between two particles is one meter. Yet you don't know where each one of them is. If you can tell that, well, this one is right here, then you, know, you will know exactly that the, the, the other one is within a one meter radius around it. 